Stephen, the great success of science seems to be the ability to look at finer and finer uh, uh, processes and uh, particles so that we are able to understand how things work at the most fundamental level. And physics has made remarkable progress uh, in, in really discerning the standard model of particle physics, the forces, et cetera, and we're almost there, not quite. Uh, but now that we're, we have so much knowledge at that level, and we look back at the, at the uh, uh, macroscopic world, it seems to be a large disconnect in terms of what those particles do and what they seem to aggregate together to make. How can we bridge that gap? I think one of the things that's been sort of a, a feature of science, a, a great success in science for a few hundred years, is this kind of idea of reducing things, to take sort of everything we see and to try and sort of grind it down and look at what its, uh, its most basic uh, constituents are. Mm -hmm. And as you say, physics has been remarkably successful in this quest. And now as far as at least everything in sort of everyday physics, we know exactly what the fundamental laws that, that govern the things we're seeing are. Yet, even given those fundamental laws, we can't talk about uh, how the weather works or how some system in biology works. Sure. So there's a question of, of how do we make a science that goes the other way, mm -hmm. that uh, goes from these, these sort of underlying pieces and back up to see the whole picture. And I, I think one of the things that uh, we, we have a, a very critical new tool that allows us to do this. And it's kind of been a, a feature of the history of science, I think, that uh, uh, many of the advances in the history of science have been driven by advances in technology, uh, whether it's uh, seeing sort of the, the early days of astronomy, which led to physics being driven by the ability to take a telescope and point sure. it at the heavens and, and see uh, sort of uh, motions that could be understood there, or, or a microscope and, and look at pond water and see mm -hmm. all these creatures running around, mm -hmm. which led to modern biology. So in today's world, I think sort of the critical tool that we have is the computer, and we can actually take that and sort of uh, point the computer out at this kind of computational universe and see what the analog of all the little creatures running around in the pond water are. <laughs> and what this allows us to do in particular is to imagine, to, to take sort of a, 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 at the beginning, a sort of an artificial physics to say, uh, if we just had these particular, uh, let's say, arbitrarily chosen rules for the constituents of our, of our physical reality, um, what would the consequences of these arbitrarily chosen rules be for the whole of the system? To go from these sort of underlying rules and to use our, our computer as, a, as an instrument to find out what the consequences of these rules should be. And it's been uh, I think it's a, it's really an exciting thing. I mean, that, that we can, uh, uh, we get to see this whole kind of, uh, new universe of possibilities. And once we, when, when we see that universe, we kind of start realizing that there's, uh, there's a new kind of science, um, not to, not to make too much of a pun on my own, on my own work, um, that, uh, that emerges from the ability to go from sort of these underlying rules to, to the whole sort of behavior of, 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 of what happens. And how do those rules relate the, the equations of modern physics uh, at the particle level uh, to the different uh, uh, structures and layers in chemistry and biology, et cetera? Uh, what, is the, what is the nexus between them? Well, so I, I think one of the things to realize is that equations, these are a particular way of specifying particular kinds of rules. And they have a, uh, a certain consequence. These equations have worked well. They're a good description for many purposes, etc. But there's really a much more basic scientific question, which is to say, imagine any kind of rules, not the particular rules that happen to work okay. for okay. our physics or our chemistry or whatever else. Uh, think about any kind of rules and ask the sort of very basic scientific question, what consequences do these arbitrary rules, these general rules have? And the thing that's been perhaps uh, surprising to me is that there are very general things that can be said. There are things that are very robust. They don't depend on the particulars of this kind of rule or that kind of rule. They're things that you can mm. say about sort of the universe of all possible rules. And some of those kinds of things, you then realize that uh, they're things that that have been very hard to say. We, we, we've been concentrating. See, I, th I think a lot of these fields, whether it's physics or something else, fields tend to be defined by their methodology in the end. At the beginning, People say physics is about studying all of physical reality. But as a practical matter, for the last 300 years, that's mostly not what physics has been about. Sure. 
uh, you know, there was a, a great advance made with, with Newton and friends being able to say, let's use mathematics, which really hadn't had much of a role in, in thinking about physical reality. Let's, let's pull in mathematics and let's see how we can do by using mathematics as kind of a formal description of what happens in the natural world and in physics. And that was very successful. Um, but I think the, the thing that, uh, of course, that, that what, what we learned from that was how particular kinds of things uh, worked, let's say, you know, the motion of planets, things like this. That methodology was not as successful at understanding how the things that seem to us more complex work. Um, and so it's, but what's tended to happen is that the things that have been defined to be this is what physics is about tend to be the things on which its basic methodology can successfully be applied. And so what we're now seeing is sort of the, our ability to, to build a new kind of science that is uh, that uses a different methodology and sort of the key to that methodology, the place you start is to just do the experiments. So that to, would mean that basically the way I asked the question is not correct. I said from the fundamental mathematical rules of physics, what rules can we take to go to these other levels? What you're saying is that there are more fundamental rules that, that sit below the equations of physics that are expressed through the equations of physics perhaps. Well, I, th I think one, th one thing to say is that there are, there are conclusions that we can draw that would be true in many artificial physics, mm -hmm. as well as in the particular mm -hmm. physics that we happen to have. And in the particular physics that we happen to have, we have we've, we've sort of carved out these particular kinds of questions that the particular methods that our current physics, typically mathematical methods, um, can successfully address. And what, uh, what is perhaps interesting is to ask um, with these more general methods that we have by looking at different kinds of rules, by looking at sort of the universe of possible computer programs, what kinds of questions then become right, easy right. to ask and answer? Right. And many of those questions have to do with things like, when we see some very complex form, what is the fundamental mechanism that causes the complexity of this form? Mm -hmm. um, they're different. For example, a good, good example comes up in, in studying snowflake growth. So sort of the traditional mathematical physics approach lets you be very precise about what will be the rate of growth of the arms of the snowflakes, things like that. But if you ask a question like, why are many snowflakes so intricate in their shapes? Mm -hmm. There's no immediate answer that you can get from sort of the traditional mathematical physics description. Right. description. But if you say, let's, let's think about other kinds of rules that we might use that, that might capture the essential mechanism that's going on in this growing ice crystal, mm. Um, it becomes actually rather straightforward to answer this different mm. kind of question. So, so in a sense, uh, we've been, you know, in sort of the historical development of, of science, particularly the physical sciences, we've been constrained by the particular methodology that has been, in many directions, so successful, the sort of mathematical methodology, but that's made us concentrate on these cases where the behavior is ultimately quite simple um, and made us avoid these cases where the behavior is ultimately quite complex. I want to ask you to put on a philosopher's hat for a moment, and I want to address the question to these new kinds of rules of this new kinds of science to the same way that people have addressed to mathematics in the past. Are these rules, like the question about mathematics, something that are necessary, that live in the so-called platonic heaven as an abstract object, or is it something that we're creating? Because it seems like we're discovering something that the universe has had all along. Well, so, so this is always an issue. Uh, to what extent is, is sort of the space of possible rules, the space of possible theories, the complete space of all that could be possible? Okay? Right. And it's, you know, we can only get circumstantial evidence about what's true about that. There's a very strong piece of circumstantial evidence that we finally now have a reasonable picture of all the kinds of rules that are possible. The circumstantial evidence is this. It's, it's, it, it, when we think about these rules as defining computations, we can ask the question, if we look at all these different kinds of computations that are defined, are they going off in different directions where this computation is very different from that computation, or is there somehow some sort of ultimate equivalence to all these computations that are being defined by all these different kinds of rules? Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about sort of the past, if you think about sort of the technology history of it, there might have, there was a time when people used to have adding machines, for example. You could have an adding machine, you could have a multiplying machine. You had, for a different purpose, you had a different machine. Mm -hmm. Then in the 1930s, there emerged this remarkable idea that it might be possible to have a single universal machine 
that could be essentially set up to act like any of these other kinds of machines, mm -hmm. the idea of universal computation. And there were all these different models for computation that people came up with, and I've come up with some myself even. Um, and one can ask the question, uh, when you look at all these different possible models, all these different kinds of ways to construct rules, it could be the case that they'd all lead to sort of different sets of rules, different kinds of computations that can be done. That hasn't been what happened. What happened is that all of these different kinds of rules all ended up being equivalent in the kinds of computations wow. that they correspond to. Mm -hmm. That's been a critical fact for our civilization mm -hmm. because it's what, uh, it's what makes software possible. It's the main thing that's driven kind of the computer revolution. It's probably the most sort of um, important uh, technological thing that's happened certainly in the last century. The, the traditional approach in, in science has been to start from sort of the overall phenomenon and try and grind it down and reduce right. it to sort of the underlying pieces. Um, there's, there's a question uh, if one tries to do things sort of the other way and one asks the question, what is sort of the, the basic, what are the basic things that come about when you start from the underlying stuff and you build up to mm -hmm. the whole? Mm -hmm. um, and what, uh, uh, there's a, there's kind of a, a new kind of science that one can build that has to do with starting from these possible underlying rules and saying from all possible underlying rules, what kind of whole, what kind of, what kind of thing is built up? And I think that kind of science, the sort of science that looks at what's out there in the computational universe, one day, this kind of science, it'll be like a physics or a chemistry or even a mathematics, but concerned not with what happens to exist in the physical universe, the chemical universe, the, the, the universe of possible mathematical forms, but concerned with sort of what exists in this computational universe of all possible rules. And that kind of science um, is, I think, what... Uh, what we can use to kind of understand uh, the, the sort of at a very fundamental level how phenomena like complexity arise.